briefings. My name is Joe Parsons. I serve as chair of the Agricultural Statistics Board here at USDA's National Ag Statistics Service. This briefing is for the Secretary of Agriculture and other policymakers at USDA to better understand the content and context of today's reports. We're pleased to have Dr. Seth Meyer, USDA's Chief Economist, as our Secretary Designate today. We're also pleased to have USDA's Deputy Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, Dr. Shafali Mehta, with us today as well. Dr. Meyer and Dr. Mehta, as you may know, the January reports cover a wide range of commodities and represent a major output for NAS. We had several folks from our regional field offices join us to work on parts of the reports. We're pleased to have the great assistance of Rosa Avila of our Sacramento office, Clarence White of our Harrisburg PA office, Matthew Henderson of our St. Louis office, Darren Jancy from Fargo, North Dakota, and Mark Hudson of our Florida office. I appreciate all of them. I also want to express my thanks to the entire NAS team working on and supporting the generation of these reports. As you may know, we had staff that, developed, that dealt with snowstorms, snow flight delays and cancellations, power outages, and health issues. Regardless of the challenges, the reports have been thoroughly prepared, and we're excited to be here today. It was a strong reminder of what a great team we have here at NAS. Although we're not live streaming today, I wanna to share the note that we've prepared for the public when we're able to safely live stream from the briefing room, which we hope to be very soon. I have a few notes for our video conference and live streaming audience. The crop production and WASDE reports are considered principal federal economic indicator reports. The Office of Management Budget provides specific guidance on how these important reports are to be released and managed. OMB directs policymaking officials not to make public comment within one hour of the release of these reports. Federal statistical agencies are guided to provide a wide distribution of information in a variety of formats and be open about processes and procedures. In order to share this briefing widely while meeting OMB guidance, we'll pause the live stream and answering questions from policymakers. You'll see a notice indicating we are addressing a question in the room. Well, we will not be taking questions during this briefing from the public. However, NAS and World Board staff are available for email or phone questions, and NAS will host a social media event one hour after the release of the crop production report. We strive to have everything presented as this briefing match the official record. Should there be any discrepancy between what is presented at this briefing and the published estimates, always refer to the official published estimates. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Lance Honig, Chief of the NAS Crops Branch. He will be immediately followed by Dr. Mark Jekinowski, Chair of the World Ag Outlook Club Board. Lance. All right, thank you, Joe, and good afternoon, and welcome to everyone that's joined us here today. Uh, as you can see, really from just looking at the title slide on the screen here, we've got a lot of information to go through today with uh, contents of six separate reports from NAS uh, being covered in various formats throughout this presentation. So with that, in mind. I'll move fairly quickly through the presentation, but Seth, as you know, if you need to stop me along the way, you can certainly do that, or we can certainly uh, take those questions at the end of the presentations if you prefer to do that as well. So as I jump into things, I'll start the way I normally do uh, before talking about the numbers, just give you a little bit of background on some of the major survey work and other uh, data sources that contributed to the estimates that are contained in the briefing in these reports today. First, from a farmer reported survey standpoint, uh, three major efforts that I'll focus on. First, our December Ag Survey. Uh, more than 77,000 producers were sampled. You can see we contacted them from November 29th through December the 19th, uh, primarily asking them about their final acreage yield and production numbers for most of the crops, uh, also asking them about the quantity of grains and oil seeds they had stored on their operation as of December the 1st, and uh, also asking those producers who grow winter wheat what their seedings are uh, for this upcoming season. So a lot of great information collected there. Uh, additionally, to fill out the rest of the grain stocks report, we also survey the off-farm grain storage facilities. Uh, you can see somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,400 of those across the country. Uh, similar data collection time frame, but again, that's where we collect the portion that's stored off the farm as of December the 1st, and then also throw out the cotton ginning survey. There's 526 active gins at this time, uh, and certainly that is highly valuable information in determining cotton production once you reach this point in the season. So I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't mention that survey effort. Additionally, we do have our objective yield work for corn, cotton, and soybeans, of course, uh, that's all final at this point in the season. 
uh, but it does contribute uh, valuable information to the process as well. And then for uh, the monthly crop production report, which contains our updated citrus forecast uh, for the Florida portion of that, you can see just a reminder, once again, this month, we have our objective measurement work, uh, primarily size and drop uh, measurements that they're taking there in nearly 1,800 groves from December 7th through the 22nd. And then, of course, in addition to all the survey work, uh, some administrative data comes into play as well. Uh, most directly, you can see the certified acres from FSA and then also uh, failed information, failed acreage information from, from both FSA and RMA. Uh, very valuable when we get to the end of the season as well in establishing those harvested acreage estimates. So uh, with that said, let me give you just a quick visual of what that December Ag survey looks like across the country. Here you can see the sample sizes by state. Uh, the little bit darker tone indicating the larger sample sizes and no big surprise as to where you would see larger and smaller samples across the country. So with that in mind, let's jump into some numbers. Uh, before we talk about the individual crops, let me give you a quick rundown on where we ended up in total. Uh, and of course, that's what I refer to as our principal crop acreage. Uh, you can see on the graphic here the final totals for the 2021 crop. Uh, 317.2 million acres planted. That is virtually unchanged from the previous estimate. And here, uh, when I refer to the previous estimate here, I'm referring back to June acres. That's the last time we actually published this total collectively. Obviously, we've made some changes to various crop acreages uh, throughout the growing season. But if you compare back to the total that we published in the acreage report, virtually unchanged uh, from that total, but it is up 2.2% or 6.76 million acres from what was planted to these same 22 crops you can see listed in the blue box at the bottom of the graphic last season. Uh, looking at the harvested acreage totals for those same 22 crops, you can see 298.7 million acres, that's up 2.5% from what was harvested a season earlier. Uh, next, I'll show you just a quick graphical representation of those acreages uh, over the last several seasons. And just uh, to refresh your memory, I showed you the same graphic back in June uh, as uh, folks were asking a lot of questions about, well, why were acreages not a little bit closer to what we saw back in 2018? And so what you see on this graphic is uh, back effective with the 2019 crop season, we made some program adjustments here at NASS. And so just to level the playing field, that lighter colored line on there uses the definitions we're using today uh, back through those early years as well. And so if you want to do an apples to apples comparison, the 317.2 million acres this season, really more comparable to a 318.3 back in uh, 2018. So really pretty comparable uh, to where we were before the big drop in 2019. And of course, we know what kind of weather challenges uh, producers experienced that season. So next we'll move on, take a look at those principal crop planted acreages by state. A uh, quick reminder of the way this map and really most of them that I'll show you today are laid out. The top number is, in this case, uh, that principal crop acreage total for the state. The lower number is the percent change from last year. Uh, all the states colored in blue are increasing. All of them colored in any shade of red are decreasing. Of course, the deeper the tone, the larger the change. And as you would really expect this season, mostly increasing acreage across the country. Probably the biggest exception would be up in the northern Rockies and uh, a bit westward from there, but generally speaking, increases to our principal crop acreages this past season. So let's move on to the individual crops. We'll start things off with corn, final planted area, 93.4 million acres, up just a tenth of a percent uh, from what we had previously estimated, 3% more than was planted last year. Light increase in the harvested area for grain over what we had previously forecast. You can see the 85.4 a million acres, just four tenths of a percent or 303,000 acres more uh, than we had previously forecast, overall up 3.7% year over year. Final yield for corn, 177 bushels per acre, unchanged from a November forecast, but it is 3.3% or 5.6 bushels per acre higher than last year's final yield. So that puts us uh, at the end of the season at 15.1 billion bushels produced, that's up four tenths of a percent from the November forecast due to that increase in harvested acreage, overall 7.1% above what was produced the season earlier. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the blue box indicating that of the uh, all the acreage that was reported to us on the December Ag Survey, about 683,000 of those acres were still left to be harvested uh, when we conducted the survey, which of course 
uh, is a very, very small percentage of the total. And of course, those 683,000 acres were still expected to be harvested. So very complete data uh, when we contacted farmers in early December. Uh, next, just a quick look at how that 177 bushel uh, per acre yield compares. Over the recent 30 seasons, you can see the trend line plotted in there pretty much uh, sitting really right on top of the trend, uh, which is kind of interesting because that's a record high yield. Um, and of course, the second highest was back in 2017, third highest back in 2018, so pretty recent years. Uh, but again, rounding out the year with a record high uh, yield this season. Uh, taking a quick look at those corn yields by state and how they compare with last season. Uh, again, this map laid out just like the one I showed you for uh, principal crops in terms of formatting. I would point out uh, the pound sign symbol here, just as a reminder to folks, anytime you see the pound sign next to a number, it indicates it's a record high. Uh, I mentioned the U.S. was record high. Uh, normally, I'll read you off a list of the states with record high yields, but the list is pretty long. And so I'm going to let you filter those out through there, but you can see uh, bottom line records across uh, much of the key growing area. Obviously, uh, the Dakotas, Minnesota, uh, showing pretty dark red colors there with the drought conditions they experienced. But once you got outside of that part of the country, uh, most of the key areas had a very, very solid season. Uh, taking a quick look next at the corn production compared to recent seasons, the 15.1 billion bushel forecast, that is the second highest on record uh, behind only 2016. And as you can tell by looking at the two bars there, barely behind 2016. In fact, the three significant digits uh, would appear to be the same, but 2016 just slightly larger than this season's crop. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the corn production estimate for today and how it compares with the published expectations. Uh, the way this graphic is laid out, each of those blue dots represents an individual industry member's published expectation of what that final corn production number would be, the red block indicating the NAS estimate today. Uh, you can see how it's tracked all season, but in particular, as you look at uh, the final for today, a little bit higher than most of the folks were expecting, obviously, uh, probably not factoring in those additional harvested acreage uh, numbers that we provided today, but overall certainly falling within the range of expectations. So it shouldn't be a big surprise uh, certainly much more in line with expectations than what we saw a season earlier at this time. Uh, next, we'll move on to soybeans. Uh, uh, similar to corn, you can see very little change to planted area, 87.2 million acres, virtually unchanged from what we had uh, previously published back uh, over the last several months, up 4.6% over what was planted last season, though. Uh, 86.3 million acres harvested uh, for beans this season. That's down just a tenth of a percent. Uh, or 104,000 acres from what we had previously published, 4.5% more, though, than what was harvested last season. Final yield for soybeans, 51.4 bushels per acre. That's up four-tenths of a percent, or two-tenths of a bushel from the November forecast. Overall, eight-tenths of a percent, or four-tenths of a bushel above last year's final yield. <clears throat> so overall, 4.44 billion bushels of soybeans produced this season up just two-tenths of a percent from the November forecast and 5.2% more than was produced last season. And again, the blue box at the bottom of the graphic showing you that of all the reports we got from producers, only about 518,000 acres still left to be harvested uh, at the time of the interview. So very complete information on the soybean crop this year as well. Next, we'll take a quick look graphically at the soybean yield and how it compares over time. Uh, second highest yield for soybeans. You can see in the graphic behind uh, only 2016, but uh, in this case above trend this season. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the soybean yields by state and how they compare with last year. Again, a very similar pattern to what we saw for corn, uh, of course, with the drought conditions in the Dakotas and Minnesota, obviously declining yields there, but eastward from there. Uh, increases and light corn, record high yields across much of the country. In fact, the list here actually a little bit longer than what we saw for corn. Uh, so you see pound signs all over this map indicating that a uh, lot of record high soybean yields across the country this season. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the soybean production over the last several seasons. And here, uh, I'll point out the U.S. Uh, production this year is a record high, uh, just slightly above the 2018 uh, production. In fact, not only nationally is it record high, but we also saw record high soybean production 
in several states, including Illinois and Iowa this season. Uh, looking at the soybean production estimate and how it compares with published expectations, boy, there you can see the red block right in the middle of all those blue dots. So it shouldn't be a surprise at all uh, with the soybean production number today. <coughs> Excuse me, next I'll move on to cotton. Uh, here I'll point out, technically these are not final cotton estimates. We'll actually finalize these estimates in May uh, once we've got the final Jennings information, but they're pretty typically pretty close to final once we get this far into the season. So as you can see, we're estimating 11.2 million acres planted to all cotton. That's up just three tenths of a percent from what we had previously forecast, 7.2% fewer acres than were planted last year. Looking at the harvested area, you can see up just half a percent uh, from what we had previously forecast. So up three tenths on the planted, five tenths on the harvested. So not much change in the abandonment uh, factor for cotton from what we had previously forecast, but compared to last season, as we've talked about all year long, a uh, big rebound there compared to uh, the challenges of last season. So up 20.5% year over year on the harvested area. Uh, yield though, 849 pounds uh, per acre, that's down 4.1% uh, or 36 pounds per acre from the forecast last month. Uh, so now we're up just two tenths of a percent or two pounds per acre over the previous season's uh, final yield, uh, putting our production at 17.6 million bales. That's down 3.6% from the December forecast, but still 20.7% above what was produced a season earlier. Uh, taking a look at that yield uh, for cotton, 849 pounds per acre, as I mentioned, just slightly above last season. So it is actually the highest yield since 2018, um, but you can see the third consecutive year below trend on the cotton yield this year. Next, we'll take a look at the cotton yields and how they compare by state with last year's uh, final yields. And here you can see increases across much of the country. Uh, in fact, record high yields in Arkansas, California, and South Carolina, Texas, and Georgia, of course, our largest producing states. You can see uh, also yields above last season in those two states as well. Uh, moving on to the cotton production and how it compares over recent seasons. And of course, you see the big uh, increase from last season on a production perspective, of course, due to the big increase in harvested area this year. Uh, so back to what I guess you would generally refer to as a more normal uh, production level than what we had seen last season. Uh, quickly run through sorghum. You can see very little change to planted area from what we had previously forecast, 7.3 million acres. Uh, up sharply, though, 24.2% year over year, big increase year over year on the harvested area as well. Final yield for sorghum at 69 bushels per acre. That's down 4.6% or 3.3 bushels per acre from what we forecast back in November, uh, down 5.7% year over year, but final production at 447.8 million bushels, uh, even though it's down nearly 5% from the November forecast, still 20% more than what was produced the season earlier. And looking at the uh, sorghum yield there, you can see pretty big drop from what we saw the last several seasons. Uh, in fact, falling back to uh, trend level and the lowest level since 2014. And looking at those yields for sorghum by state and how they compare to last year, mostly declining yields. Uh, and of course, Texas and Kansas making up about three fourths or, or more of the uh, sorghum production in the country. You can see decreasing yields in both of those states this year, but overall, because of the increase in acreage, uh, you can see that actually gives us a final production number at the highest level since 2016. Uh, quite a few other crops included in the annual crop production report today. I'll run through these fairly quickly. Uh, canola production, you can see up 15.6% over what we had previously forecast, but still 21.2% uh, below what uh, was actually produced last season. Of course, a lot of canola produced in uh, the Northern Plains area where we saw the dry conditions this season certainly impacted there. Uh, similar story for the chickpeas. Overall, you can see the production there down 30% year over year. Uh, again, a lot of chickpeas produced up in the areas where uh, drought conditions were uh, weighed very heavily on the crop this season. In fact, looking at the yield, they're down 50%. Uh, year over year for the chickpeas this season. So having, even though you've got 40% more acres, 
when you cut your yield in half, your uh, production takes a real hit. Uh, dry edible beans, you can see a lot fewer acres this year. Uh, planted area down 19.3% uh, from a year ago, but yields also impacted there by dry conditions down 13.3%, putting our final production for dry edible beans at 22.7 million hundredweight. Uh, slight increase from the previous forecast at 30.4% below a season earlier. Uh, similar story again for the dry edible peas. Uh, big cut in yield there. You can see 54% below uh, the previous season's yield. Uh, so overall, combine that with the lower acreage, and you've got 60.5% less dry edible peas produced this year compared to the previous season. Uh, flax seed uh, up 6.6% on our planted area this season. Uh, but due to increased abandonment, you can see harvested area down 9.5%, big cut in yield uh, year over year. So overall, uh, less than half uh, of what was produced last year uh, for this year's crop of flaxseed. Uh, looking at our hay crops this season, uh, first looking at all hay, you can see 50.7 million acres harvested uh, for both alfalfa and other hay. Uh, that's down 2.9% year over year. Our final yield for all hay down 2.5%. So overall, 5.2% uh, less production for all hay. Uh, of course, all hay doesn't mean a lot. So let's talk about alfalfa and other hay separately. 15.2 uh, million acres of alfalfa harvested this season. That's down 6.1% from a year earlier. Yields down just 1.2%, 3.23 tons per acre on the alfalfa. Uh, so overall, uh, 49.2 million tons, that's 7.2% below uh, what was produced the season earlier. Uh, similarly, for the other hay, uh, you can see yields down there as well. So overall, 3.8% reduction in other hay production uh, this season compared to a year earlier. Uh, hops, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see uh, we're kind of continuing this trend of uh, increasing acres and production for hops. In fact, for this season, uh, both acreage and production are a new record high, uh, but that's kind of been the trend the last several seasons. Uh, moving on to lentils, big increase in the planted area this year. You can see up 35.4% year over year, uh, but only 7.6% more acres harvested due to that higher abandonment. And again, like I've talked about with several crops grown in the northern uh, portions of the country, big cut in yield, and so overall 55% reduction in uh, the amount of lentils produced this season. Moving on, uh, looking at mustard seed, uh, similar story there, big cut in yield, big drop in production year over year. Looking at peanuts, 4.6% uh, fewer acres planted this year, similar reduction on the harvested area. Yield, though, up 8.4%. Uh, from the previous season. And in fact, that's the second highest yield on record uh, for peanuts. And looking at the production, uh, that's actually the third highest production on record for peanuts. So very good peanut crop uh, this season. Nice to talk about something positive after all those negatives I've just gone over uh, in the other portions of the country. Uh, this time of year, we also provide our annual estimates for peppermint. Uh, you can see acreage there, just 44,000, down 10.2% year over year. Slight increase in the yield at 104 pounds per acre, uh, but overall production down 6.5% uh, year over year. In fact, both the acreage and the production are record lows uh, for the peppermint this season. Uh, looking at final numbers for our potato crop, 943,000 acres planted. A uh, slight reduction from what we'd previously forecast, but up 2.7% year over year. Similar increase from last year on the harvested area. Final yield, though, 438 hundred weight per acre. That's down 5% from the previous season. So overall, 409.7 million hundred weight produced for potatoes down slightly from the previous forecast and 2.5% uh, below last season. That's the lowest potato production since 2010. Uh, Proso millet, uh, everybody wants to know about Proso millet, right? So you can see big increase in acreage this season, yield up sharply as well. Uh, so overall up 60.6% year over year, but in reality, that's really just a return to a more normal uh, production level. Colorado's our big producer for the Proso millet. They had a severely uh, reduced uh, crop last season due to drought. And so we're really just bouncing back. Uh, to a more normal level on Proso Millet this season.
Uh, next, we'll move on uh, to a few other crops, rapeseed. Uh, overall production there, you can see up 13.6% year over year. Rice, a uh, big drop in acreage this year, as we've talked about all season long, 16.6% fewer acres planted, 16.7%. Uh, fewer acres harvested, but the yield at 7,709 pounds per acre is a record high. And in fact, we saw record high yields for rice in Arkansas, California, Mississippi, and Missouri as well. So uh, overall, very good yields, but because of the drop in acreage, final production for rice still down 15.7% from the previous season. Uh, safflower, uh, again, increasing acreage, but the yields down 15.5% year over year. So that crop 11.1% smaller than last season. Smearment, very, very similar to the story I told you on the peppermint, uh, record low acreage for spearmint this year as well, down 16.3%, uh, a little bit of a drop in yield as well. So overall production down 19.4%. Uh, looking at our sugar crops first, the sugar beets, not much change. Uh, to the acreage, the planted area from what we had previously published, a little bit more abandonment though. You can see with the harvested area down 3.7% from the previous forecast, largely due uh, to the size of the crop. Some of the factories uh, obviously having to direct some acreage to be abandoned uh, because they only want so much production. And so we see this occasionally when the crop is uh, as good as it's been this year. And it has been good. In fact, that's a record high yield. Um, at 33.2 tons per acre. And even with the additional uh, acres abandoned, you can see the final uh, production numbers there are still the second highest on record for sugar beets. Uh, moving on to sugar cane, uh, 938,000 acres harvested for that crop. That's up seven tenths of a percent from the previous forecast, but still 1.1% below uh, what was harvested last year. A little bit of a decrease in the yield, 1.9% below. Uh, that last forecast of 35.2 tons per acre, uh, putting production at just over 33 uh, million tons. That's down 1.3% from the last forecast and 8.5% uh, below what was produced last season. That's still a top 10 uh, crop, though, for sugarcane this year, even though it's down uh, from last season. Sunflowers, you can see big cuts there uh, compared to a year ago, 25% uh, fewer acres planted. A uh, fairly significant drop in yield year over year. So overall production there, 36.2% below uh, the previous season. And tobacco, uh, again, kind of interesting this season to see increasing acreage. That's not, not something we've talked about for the last several years for tobacco, uh, but we did see 14.6% uh, more acres harvested this year. We saw an increase in the yield. So overall tobacco production up 28.2%. Uh, from what was produced a season earlier. Uh, that kind of wraps up the 2021 crop in terms of acreage yield and production. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, we also get our first look at the 2022 winter wheat planted acreage uh, this time of year. And so that's what we've got to talk about here. Farmers uh, reporting that they planted 34.4 million acres for harvest in 2022 for winter wheat. That's up 2.2% uh, from the previous season. If we break that down by class, uh, hard red winter area up about 1%, soft red up about 6%, and the white wheat primarily up in the Pacific Northwest up about 2% uh, from what was planted the previous season. Uh, if we look at that over the last uh, several seasons here, you can see this actually represents the second consecutive year of increasing acreage. Uh, also something we haven't talked about in quite a while, but because of the uh, long-standing decline that we had seen prior to the last uh, two years, I can say that it's the highest level since 2016, but still the 10th lowest planted area on record. And so we'll see where things go from here. But as we take a look at the winter wheat planted acres by state and how they compare with last year, uh, you can see kind of a mix across the country, obviously, uh, increases through the plain states, and of course, that's where you pick up a lot of the, a lot of those acres. That's where most of our winter wheat is grown. Uh, some declines across the southeast, so you can see uh, some red states there, and then various points across the country as well. But, but again, uh, increasing for the second consecutive year, so that's good news for uh, winter wheat producers. If we look at how the winter wheat planted acreage estimate compares with the published expectations. 
uh, kind of an interesting uh, spread of of people's expectations out there. As you can see, it not only spans a pretty pretty wide range of acreage, uh, but you can see kind of a gap in between. So I guess there's two schools of thought out there about what acreage was going to look like. But overall, uh, the estimate seems to fall nicely within uh, the range of those expectations. So I don't think should be a big surprise here today either. Uh, next, we'll kind of shift gears a little bit and turn our attention to the grain stocks report. Uh, we'll start things off by talking about all wheat stocks since this is second quarter stocks for wheat. Uh, you can see as of December the 1st, 1.39 billion bushels were stored. That's down 18.4% from uh, the same time a year earlier. On-farm stocks down 43.5%. Off-farm stocks down just 8.4% uh, from the same time a year earlier. If we take a look at this next graphic, the way it's laid out, each of the blue bars represents the beginning supply uh, for each of those crop seasons. And of course, you see the four horizontal lines representing the four quarterly stocks estimates. Of course, as I mentioned, this is second quarter stocks for all wheat. So we're looking at the orange line. Um, as we look at the beginning supply, the 2.49 billion bushels, that was down 12.8%. Uh, from the previous season, looking at the September to November disappearance, 384 million bushels. Uh, that was actually down 15.7% from the same period a year earlier. Uh, but as we look at the uh, December 1 all wheat stocks estimate and how it compares with expectations, uh, generally speaking, although if you kind of look at the range, it may appear to be down toward the bottom. But if you really look closely, you can see that's where most of the dots are clustered. Um, and so even though you see uh, maybe a bit higher range, I think overall that appears to fit uh, pretty nicely with what most folks were expecting today. Uh, next, we'll move on to December 1 corn stocks. Of course, this is first quarter stocks uh, for corn, 11.6 billion bushels stored as of December the 1st. That's up 3.1% uh, year over year. On farm stocks up 2.7%, off farm up 3.9%. Uh, from a year ago, of course, our production was a billion bushels larger than the previous season, so not surprising that we would see uh, higher stocks year over year. Uh, looking at a similar graphic to that one I showed you for uh, all wheat, but of course here first quarter, uh, you can see the orange line here. 16.3 uh, billion bushels was our beginning supply. That's 2% higher than the previous season. Looking at the disappearance over the last quarter from September through November, 4.7 billion bushels. Uh, that's down about seven tenths of a percent uh, from the same time period a year earlier. Uh, and as we look at the corn stocks estimate, how it compares with expectations, pretty much right in the middle of the range there. So I don't think this should be a big surprise uh, either. Uh, moving on to soybean stocks again, second quarter, just like uh, corn. So for soybeans, 3.15 billion bushels stored as of December the 1st, that's up 6.9%. Uh, year over year, on-farm stocks up 16.3%. The off-farm stocks for soybeans down seven tenths of a percent uh, from a year earlier. Uh, again, looking at the same graphic I've been showing you at the beginning, uh, supply for soybeans 4.69 uh, billion bushels, actually down 1.1% uh, from the previous season disappearance over the last quarter, 1.54 billion bushels. That's actually down 14% from the previous year as well, but still uh, still the increase year over year on what's stored December the 1st. Looking at soybean stocks uh, estimate, how it compares with published expectations, again, uh, certainly falling within the range of the expectations there, maybe just a little bit above the middle, um, but doesn't appear to be a big surprise there today either. Uh, next, I'll move on to uh, December rough rice stocks. Uh, you can see 127 million, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 100 weight stored as of December the 1st. That's down 6.6% from a year earlier, uh, down 6.9% on farm, down 6.6% for the off farm uh, year over year. As we look at uh, how things stack up for the season four uh, rice stocks here, 229 million 100 weight is your beginning supply. You can see that's down from a year earlier. Our disappearance over the last quarter, 102.4 million hundredweight compares with 115.8 last season. So not a big change there either. 
Of course, also included in the monthly crop production report today is our December 1 hay stocks information. So beginning uh, stocks information for hay, uh, you can see about 79 million uh, tons stored as of December the 1st. That's down 6% uh, from a year earlier. Of course, I mentioned the lower production numbers for hay uh, earlier on in the presentation. But looking at that December 1 total, that is the third lowest beginning stock since 1977. Um, and so not probably a huge surprise considering some of the dry conditions out in certain portions of the country this year. Uh, but overall, looking at the disappearance, of course, which runs all the way back to May, we estimate stocks in December and May. So May to November, 59.2 million tons. That's down about 6% from the same time a year earlier. I do have a map for you here showing you how those uh, hay stocks numbers compare across the state. Uh, and again, much as you might expect, you see the big declines up in the portion of the country most heavily impacted by the drought uh, and kind of a mix of increases and de decreases across uh, much of the rest of the country. You do see the uh, ampersand symbol, I believe is the uh, term we like to use for that, indicating record lows on this map. And we do see record low December 1 stocks in Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Oregon this season. We have just a few more crops to talk about from the stocks report today. Uh, first, barley stocks, you can see overall down 34.3% uh, from a year earlier. The on-farm stocks down 49%, off-farm down 14%. Chickpea stocks uh, off pretty sharply, again, with the smaller crop that I described earlier on. Similar story for the dry edible peas. Uh, Durham wheat stocks down 30.2%. Uh, year over year, the on-farm stocks down 56.7%. Off-farm stocks actually up 15.3% for Durham. Uh, lentils, much like the dry edible peas and chickpeas, down sharply uh, year over year. Oat stocks overall down 11.2% from the previous uh, December. Uh, on-farm stocks down sharply. Off-farm stocks up about 9.7% year over year. And sorghum stocks. You can see up across the board there, total 31.6% more than a year earlier, 38.3% uh, more on farm, 30.9% more stored off the farm. And as I get close to wrapping up here, uh, shifting gears a little bit again here, now talking about the current uh, citrus crop, our updated forecast this month for uh, citrus. We'll run through this very quickly. All orange production now, I expected to total 3.92 uh, million tons. That's up 2.4% from the previous forecast, but still down 11.3% uh, from what was actually produced last season. We actually see a decrease month over month in Florida, uh, but a larger increase in California uh, from last month due to expected uh, increases in yield from what we had previously forecast there, pushing that all orange production forecast above where we were just last month. And as you compare across the non-Valencias and Valencias, you can see the increase month over month is on the non-Valencia portion of the crop. The Valencia is actually down uh, month over month. Uh, looking at the grapefruit crop, we're now expecting 378,000 tons. Uh, that's down 16.7% from the previous forecast. So we're now down 11.3% year over year. Really the big decrease month over month they're coming in Texas as we're uh, discovering that the tree damage from that late frost they had last season having a much bigger impact on production this year than previously expected. And so a pretty big cut in the expectation on the grapefruit crop uh, this month. Uh, looking at lemons, 976,000 tons expected to be produced. That's up 9.4% uh, month over month, 10.4% above last season. That's really a return to a more normal level uh, this season for the lemon crop. And then tangerines at 878,000 tons up, or I'm sorry, down just slightly from the previous forecast. Uh, but again, as we've talked about earlier this year, the sharp decrease uh, year, of course, most of that crop produced in California. So uh, that's driving the decrease year over year uh, for that crop. Uh, just a few slides to wrap things up here. First, just a quick rundown on some of the upcoming reports. Over the next month, you can see uh, the next Cotton Jennings report, as well as cattle on feed, coming out on the 21st. At the end of the month, in addition to ag prices, we will have our cattle and sheep and goats reports 
Uh, and then, of course, February 1st is normal. You'll see our monthly care reports before we move into the next cycle uh, of reports following that. A quick reminder for folks out there that the Ag Outlook Forum is coming up uh, February 24th and 25th. Of course, it'll be virtual, uh, but just want to make sure that's on everybody's radar and they know they've got an opportunity to get registered there. And as Joe alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, I'll be hosting our monthly stat chat series at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time this afternoon, giving folks an opportunity to ask any questions that they might have about all the information uh, that I've just shared with you here this afternoon and they found in the various reports today. And so with that said, I finally got into the last slide that I have for you. Um, I'm assuming you probably would prefer to hold your questions until after Mark finishes his presentation, but I'll leave that up to you. So you let me know uh, uh, if that sounds I good will. to you, then uh, I'll turn it over to Mark. I'll save them, but looking forward to the cattle report as well, too. Uh, an important report to be looking at. I appreciate that. Go ahead, Dr. Jaganowski. All right. All right. Very good, Mark. The floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Lance. So you don't need a seventh inning stretch or anything here. Forge right through. <laughs> well, I think you're going to get a little bit of a break here because um, I'm sharing my screen and we've been noticing there's a little delay. So just give me a thumbs up when it actually is showing up. It should be there any minute. It's on my screen. There you go. We're good. got it. All right, good. All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and jump right in. Um, so, uh, Seth, as you know, uh, January, busy month for us, of course. We got all of this information that, uh, that Lance just described. Uh, incorporating it into the uh, domestic crop balance sheets, and then this year, uh, this time of the year as well, is a, is a time when we uh, really uh, shift our focus to southern hemisphere crops, southern hemisphere production. So a few things we're going to walk through today include um, uh, new estimates for Argentina wheat uh, based on some you know uh, late season rains that improved improved the yields there, uh, soybeans and um, uh, Argentina and Paraguay, uh, where it's been, as you know, just from our watching the watching the news, it's been pretty hot and dry lately. Brazil soybeans and corn, uh, kind of some competing uh, uh, competing situations there. Very good in the north, very dry in the south. And then we'll also talk a little bit about Australia cotton, where uh, uh, weather conditions in in Australia have really turned around over since the past couple of years ago when. Uh, severe drought. Now they are experiencing some really good growing conditions, favorable rain. So um, let's jump in with wheat. Uh, wheat uh, global production. A couple changes here to note. As I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about about Argentina. That's the uh, the majority of the change this month for wheat. Uh, EU uh, increased uh, production there. That's just based on AgMin data. That's all France right there. But when, when it comes to Argentina, uh, that uh, it's worth a little bit of a, a drill down there. So Argentina, uh, this time of year, that crop is just about completely harvested. Maybe a little bit, a little bit of harvest still going on in the southern part of the country, southern Buenos Aires. But for the most part, that harvest is complete. And as you might recall. Uh, weather conditions started out there relatively dry, um, but uh, things kind of turned around later in the season and uh, got some timely rains, favorable rains that uh, really kind of pulled that crop through. So here's just a couple of the, you know, the main crop area for Argentina, as you can see, pretty dry early. Uh, some periods here where we, you know, were worried that it would stay dry, but then we started to see those timely beneficial rains right up toward the end of the season. And then things dried out at the end, great for harvest. But this is gonna lead a little bit into my soybean story, um, soybean and corn coming up for uh, Argentina and Brazil. Um, along with it uh, being dry uh, toward the end of uh, December, it also got pretty warm. Uh, again, this is the main crop area for, for wheat in Argentina. Southern Argentina, Generally the same. It was a, it was a little bit drier. Started out a little bit drier, but again, uh, the the beneficial rain started coming late in the season, and uh, you know seemed to support that crop. 
So when it's all said and done for Argentina, that's going to be record production this year. Um, and a, a yield increase this month of, um, of up, up 3%. So, so not, not insignificant. Uh, global balance sheet, uh, again, production with a little bit of, uh, with the increase this month as, as well, we're looking at record production for wheat. Uh, uh, feed use down, that's mainly reflecting uh, um, uh, lower feed use in, in the EU and Ukraine, uh, US as well. Trade down a bit as well. A uh, couple stories there to talk about. One being the, uh, uh, a lot of that is Russia, uh, reduced exports out of Russia. Um, I think, as you know, they recently instituted a, a wheat export quota of 8 million tons beginning in the middle of February through June. So that'll be partially upset by, uh, offset by greater exports by the EU. But nevertheless, it's going to result in a, in a little bit of a reduction in global trade. US, U.S. balance sheet for wheat, um, again, not, uh, not, big, not, not particularly big changes, but, but kind of some noteworthy developments here. Imports down, that's again, just based on the pace of imports. That is entirely HRS and Durham, tighter supplies in Canada, driving those reduced imports there. Um, Feed and residual down a bit as well, 25 million bushels. That's reflecting, that's incorporating the new information from the December 1 stocks report. Exports down uh, as well, 15 million bushels. And again, that's uh, looking at the pace of exports uh, to date. Um, that's, uh, uh, that reduction is entirely hard red winter, slow pace of hard, hard, wood, hard red winter and uh, expected higher exports out of Argentina, where, as you just saw, we, we raised that crop, that crop coming in uh, at a record. Um, what else can I tell you? I uh, raised the market price, 10 cents. Uh, the marketing year average price to date is 6.95. So we expect that to continue to strengthen the balance of the marketing year. Um, so moving into soybeans, I'm gonna, you know, um, kind of continue a focus on South America because that's driving much of our soybean global balance sheet this time. And as you can see, we pulled back our production estimates for Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Argentina, um, you know, much the same story. Well, you know, similar story that I was telling you about for wheat, focusing on the fact that things have really dried out there uh, since mid um, since mid uh, December. So at this point, uh, the crop is still very in its very early stages. Uh, it's about 93% planted. Uh, planting has been, has been trending later and later each year. So you know, much, so there, you know, so there's some still some crop that hasn't gotten in, into the ground yet. But we're in the late stages of planting. Uh, um, and when we look at the kind of the main growing area here for for soybeans, overlaps a lot with wheat. Again, it, you know, we're getting some pretty good rains up through mid mid December, and then things really dried out here toward the end of December and into January. Uh, and at the same time, temperatures started to to get pretty hot there right around Christmas as well. So it's been hot, it's been dry, and that's been weighing weighing on the conditions. Uh, Northwest Argentina, uh, roughly the same. Again. Yeah, got some rains in early December, and then things really dried out uh, toward the middle of the month into the new year. Uh, and then when we look at Brazil, so br the situation in Brazil, a little bit more complicated because there's, there's kind of two stories here, very favorable conditions in the north and center west and uh, that area, but very dry in the south. And here we're looking at both um, uh, soybeans and, of course, for first crop corn as well in, um, in Brazil. So I'll, I'll kind of cover both of those at the same time here. Uh, just to, again, to kind of drive home the point, the differences in the conditions in these two regions, December precipitation 
uh, focused on here. Uh, very uh, abundant in the north, very dry in the south, shows up uh, particularly uh, uh, dramatically in the percent of normal pre precipitation in, in December, especially particularly dry here in the southern part of the country. And when we look at a couple of the rainfall traces just for individual re uh, regions, it, I think it comes especially clear, becomes especially clear. It's been dry since um, uh, early November, uh, long periods of, of virtually no rain from early in November, right almost through the end of December. This is Parana. Um, uh, shows up as well in a very poor um, vegetative health index compared to the past 20 years or so. When you look at, uh, go a little bit further south, Rio Grande de Sol, things look even drier. Of course, this crop is even, you know, um, less developed at this point, um, not fully planted for either corn or soybeans, but nevertheless, very dry here in the south. Contrast that, of course, with, uh, you know, Mato Grosso, um, it, you know, average rains, very abundant, uh, got off to a good start as well uh, compared to last year where things started out relatively dry. This year, the rains have been coming timely, uh, pretty consistent throughout the, throughout the season. Then if you move further west into Western Bahia, it's been incredibly um, uh, incredibly, incredibly um, uh, moist in terms of the, the rainfall conditions there. So very good growing conditions. So for Brazil, uh, pulled back our yield forecast, you know, again, these offsets between the northern part of the country and the southern part, uh, pulled back our yield forecast still despite lower yields with higher area, still looking at record production, soybean production for Brazil at least as of right now. Uh, global balance sheet, again, this uh, global balance sheet is driven mostly by the conditions that we just discussed in South America. Uh, production down, that's largely a South American story, uh, tighten, tightening up total supplies. Crush down as well, that's mostly Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Now, I didn't mention Paraguay in my slides, but worth noting, Bar Paraguay in that same region of southern Brazil also facing dry conditions and we've pulled back our uh, 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 soybean production estimate for Paraguay as well. Uh, trade down as well reflecting those tighter supplies um, and, and ending stocks tightening up. Trade reduction down not quite as much as, as some of the you know as much as ending stocks and, and, and as much as production. Keep in mind that given the way the trade years uh, break across Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, uh, the U.S. is likely to pick up some increased um, trade business, some increased export business because of those tighter supplies in South America. U.S. Uh, supply and demand uh, balance sheet for soybeans. Uh, not very big changes this year, of course, incorporating those that production change from NAS. Uh, relatively small change in production, for the most part, just uh, just drops right into ending stocks. Uh, no change in exports this month. Raised our season average market price fifty cents a bushel, as you can see there. Even though I mean we got you know with this little bit uh, higher production, you know uh, increased stocks to race, increased stocks to use ratio, higher ending stocks. But keep in mind that it's the global. Uh, supply and demand balance sheet that's really tightening up and it's supporting those prices. So, uh, so raised uh, the market price accordingly to reflect that. Moving into corn, again, a lot of what we've talked about for, uh, for soybeans also is reflected in our corn production estimates this month. Uh, Argent pulled back our production forecasts for Argentina and Brazil. This is, of course, the Brazil first crop corn, the smaller of the two that they produce. Um, but uh, given those dry conditions, especially in the southern part of Brazil, um, uh, uh, we pulled back our uh, corn, Brazil corn production uh, forecast by 3 million tons. Argentina as well, uh, again, reflecting the early planted corn 
uh, dry, con dry conditions faced there, uh, pulled back our production forecast. Uh, most of the rest of the uh, production changes, again, based on data, I uh, should note there's some offsetting increases in Ukraine based on harvest result. So um, even though South American supplies are tightening up, UK Ukraine production is up by 2 million tons, offsetting some of that tightness this month. Uh, global balance sheet. Uh, I put up last year's balance sheet um, along with the, the, the new one, just to put, uh, draw your attention to the trade. Uh, uh, trade variable there that reflects uh, just it, it the recent data on uh, Argentina and Brazil corn shipments apparently there's been some fairly large late season shipments out of Argentina in Brazil so that's what's driving that increase and also tightening up ending stocks for the old crop year and beginning stocks for the uh, current crop year um, other than that, we talked about supplies tightening up overall globally, uh, feed use uh, up a bit, mainly that's feed use up in Ukraine where supplies are increased as well, but uh, offset by lower feed use in Argentina and the EU. Uh, trade uh, down a bit, that's a little bit lower trade in the US. Um, uh, offset by higher exports out of Ukraine and then the ending stocks. Um, that's mainly ending stocks out of Brazil and Argentina, uh, offset by higher stocks in the U.S. So let's talk a little bit about the U.S. balance sheet. Again, incor incorporating those changes from NAS this morning, uh, raised, you know, raised production accordingly. Um, Exports reduced, uh, and this reflects slow pace of exports and more competitor exports, especially from the Ukraine here. Um, and uh, also worth noting, ethanol production increased, uh, adjusted upwards this month as well. Uh, as you know, strong demands, good margins, uh, production uh, continues and, and high oil, High oil prices, rising oil prices as, as well, continuing to support that industry, continuing to support um, uh, corn demand for ethanol. Uh, so when you balance it all out, a little bit of an increase in ending stocks uh, this month, uh, incorporating those uh, new production estimates and a slight uptick in the stocks to use ratio, no change in the season average market price. Uh, moving into rice, not a lot to talk about on the glo on the global production side. Uh, a little change in Sri Lanka here, uh, evidently, and I don't fully understand this, but uh, at some point here, uh, Sri Lanka had banned imports of fertilizer. So that is going to uh, reduce their production a little bit. Seems like a kind of a, a counterintuitive um, policy for, uh, in, for supporting production, but there you go. Uh, so that's behind that reduction in uh, Sri Lanka production. And then some other small changes on the uh, global production side. Um, world rice supply and use, a um, few things worth pointing out here. Production, again, uh, that is a record, perhaps a record high production for 2021-22. Um, relatively small changes everywhere else. Ending stocks down a bit, not quite a record. Last year was a record. So down from last year, just marginally. Um, trade up a bit, I uh, got some offsets there. Increased exports out of India, uh, offset by some reductions out of uh, uh, Brazil and Paraguay. So relatively small changes on the world supply and use uh, balance sheet this month. US balance sheet. Again, incorporating the NAS changes on the production side, um, tightens up the, the supply a bit, but also tightening up the supply this month is a pretty sharp reduction in imports. And this is a story that we've been uh, kind of reporting over and over a month, you know, uh, month to month, uh, slow pace of, of imports, uh, reflecting uh, supply chain constraints, uh, High, high shipping rates, container shortages, whatever it is, those um, imports are not are just not coming in. 
two million of that reduction in, in imports is long grain. Uh, so that's a long grain from uh, aromatic rices, primarily from, uh, from Asia. Exports down as well. Uh, that's uh, mainly medium short grain rice there and uh, based on a slow pace of exports to Northeast Asia. Um, so total use down, ending stocks tightening up a bit and uh, season average price uh, adjusted upward just a bit and that's reflecting higher prices for both long grain and medium short. Moving into cotton, a couple changes worth noting here. Uh, we'll talk about the United States, pretty, pretty sharp production for this time of the year uh, for the United States, which we'll uh, talk about in the US balance sheet. On the foreign side, I mentioned uh, Australia. I have one quick slide on that. China, uh, that increased production there. That's mainly uh, the uh, Xinjiang uh, ginning data coming out of that area in uh, showing higher production. Uh, India, production down, that's again, just based on arrivals data and then a small, uh, small uh, increase in Pakistan as well. Australia really can be summarized in, in, in one slide, uh, just been very favorable, a big turnaround from the drought conditions that we saw over the past uh, several years. Uh, reservoirs are, are, uh, are replenished, good conditions for both, so good conditions for irrigated cotton and also good conditions for dry land cotton too, given the uh, beneficial rain, favorably wet, um, not too much rain, just uh, coming as it's needed. And as a result, uh, production this year will be up almost double from where it was last year. So global cotton supply and demand, uh, in, uh, reduction in production, that's mainly the US there, uh, tightening up supplies. Uh, trade down as well, that is mainly lower imports by China. We did uh, increase our China balance sheet. Uh, you'll note uh, China ending stocks increasing there a bit. It's just uh, after we balance it all out, higher production in China, uh, but also you know offset a little bit by lower consumption and, and uh, lower imports as well. The result being just a little bit of an increased adjustment this month in China's ending stocks. Globally, ending stocks tightening up uh, this month and down year over year. U.S. balance sheet, uh, again, uh, uh, incorporating the production changes from NAS that uh, Lance just talked about. Uh, for this time of year, this is a pretty big change in, in uh, cotton production based on uh, that uh, reduction in yield. As a matter of fact, Steve points out that it is the second largest change in production for January, going back as far as his data goes back. So that's at least 30 years or so. Um, now, uh, we also reduced exports. And uh, worth noting there, too, that we would have reduced exports regardless of um, uh, this change in production. Of course, we didn't didn't necessarily anticipate this uh, redu uh, reduction in production coming into this lockup, but um, uh, but it, it but it it's consistent with you know the, our reduction in exports as well. We just haven't seen the pace there, um, slow pace, especially to China, and maybe with this uh, change in production, it's suggesting that those supplies were a little bit tighter than we anticipated, and they just um, were not all available. Um, ending stocks tightening up a bit uh, there as well. Uh, stocks to use ratio tightening up didn't make any changes in their season average market price. As you know, those prices have been high and we have adjusted them, adjusted them uh, higher the past few months by quite a bit. Moving into sugar real quick. Uh, old crop here, just a few uh, data updates there, mainly from SMD data, small revisions. On the new crop year for 2021, Few things worth noting: uh, increased our production forecast quite a bit this month. That largely driven by higher um, cane production. This is based on industry data showing that that harvest is actually ending very strong, finishing up very strong. Very good sucrose recovery. 
So that is driving that increased production. Also increased beet uh, sugar from beets as well, uh, reflecting good recovery there as well. Um, imports down, adjusted the imports lower uh, this month by 60,000 tons. Basically what happened there is, as, as you recall, the TRQ was extended to the December 31st. Now we're past December 31st. And uh, a lot of those shipments that we anticipated just never arrived. So, so there you go. So ending stocks up, uh, stocks use ratio now at 14.4%. And in March, we will be rebalancing this based on that 13.5% um, stocks to use ratio. But uh, this is where we are for now. Uh, nothing to talk about on the Mexico balance sheet, no changes whatsoever this month. So moving into livestock, meat, meat and livestock real quick. I'm gonna focus here mainly on, or really entirely on 2022. Uh, 2021 is behind us, but we're still getting in some of that late, uh, you know, data for, um, uh, you know, production and trade for December. But for the most part, that year is over and there's not a lot to talk about. But when we look at 2022, uh, on the beef side, increased production uh, there, as you can see, um, that uh, reflects higher than anticipated fourth quarter placements, which will, which are expected to enter the um, slaughterhouses later this year. Uh, pork production pulled back uh, and that uh, reflects again the, the information we got from the hogs and pigs report, which as you know, showed slower far farrowing intentions for the first half of this year. So that should tighten up supplies later in uh, the calendar year. Um, uh, broiler production up as well, based on first quarter pace, pretty strong. Uh, and worth noting that for all of these uh, production changes, for the most part, we're looking at the fundamentals here, kind of looking for the moment, kind of looking beyond the kind of recent short-term reductions in, in slaughter pace that we've seen, which may be, be due to labor constraints and other issues um, uh, reflecting uh, Omicron or whatnot. Um, so prices, uh, looking at prices, uh, increased our... Um, uh, steer price, dollar fifty hundred weight, strong demand uh, there, uh, pulling, keeping those prices high, pulling them higher. Uh, no changes to the hog price forecast. Uh, same with broilers, uh, strong demand, uh, strong current prices, uh, current observed absorb prices. So we uh, increased our broiler price by broiler price by ten cents per pound. Turkeys up by two point three cents per pound. Uh, trade, U.S. meat trade, uh, again, the main, you know, main focus of uh, primary interest is 2022, but I put up 2021 just because there are, are, were some fairly big changes there, but I will point out that those just reflect some data revisions from the census, um, mainly reflecting exports on the broiler side uh, to Mexico. So that is that big reduction, relatively large reduction in broiler exports that's showing up there in 2021. When we look at 2022, uh, clearly the number that jumps out at you there is the 405 reduction in uh, pork ex uh, exports. That mainly reflects weak imports, weak demand from China. Uh, and when China is importing less pork, that means competing suppliers of pork are also supplying to, you know, everyone, the, the pie has shrunk. So we're potentially losing exports, not only to China, but also to other countries, other competing importers, which are, um, uh, which EU and other suppliers are also competing to supply. So again, it's largely driven by lower imports from China, driving the total, driving the overall reduction in meat trade for 2022. Wrapping things up with dairy, again, the focus on 2022 here as um, 2021 is behind us. Uh, no production changes this month, um, but a uh, few other noteworthy changes here. Uh, I can, kind of be summarized by higher import, imports are adjusted higher 
exports lower, reflecting high U.S. prices, uh, very high current U.S. product prices. Um, so fat bases ex exports there pulled down. That's mainly uh, butter and cheese. Uh, skim solid basis exports down. That's mainly uh, skim milk powder. And uh, and higher higher U.S. prices also attracting uh, imports uh, accordingly. And speaking of prices, so U.S. dairy prices, uh, again, focusing on 2022, uh, very strong, significant uh, price strength across all, all major products here, uh, adjusting them higher this month. Um, and those are also reflected in uh, upward adjustments in our class prices. Class three price up $1.50 a hundred weight. That's mainly you know, your cheese and whey. Class four price up, that's mainly butter and uh, pulling the all milk price up as well by $1.85 per hundred weight. And, um, and that's all I have in terms of the WASD. So I will leave it there and open it up to questions. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, Seth, um, the floor is yours. <laughs>